Welcome everyone. The question we're here to answer is how smart can vehicles get? And we have three very smart people to help us through the conversation. Uh, Louis Eldad, I'd like to start with you. We've been right. talking, hearing from uh, Michelle there about self-driving cars. Your company works on the LiDAR sensors, the essential technology that allows cars to see. Right. Where are we in the development of that technology and how reliable is it now when it comes to getting cars to work by themselves? Right, well, we have come a long way. Uh, LiDARs used to have the form that you see on the old Google cars, you know, this big and mechanically spinning and so on. And they just, let's make it simple. And now today they look like this. And they're completely solid state based on silicon CMOS, no moving parts. And the price dropped from $80,000 to a couple hundred dollars. And in terms of reliability, you know, how effective is this technology in guiding a car? This is uh, Silicon CMOS, the most reliable, the most mature technology uh, for uh, photonics and electronics. Uh, we guarantee over 100,000 hours of operation. Okay. Uh, Vitaly Palamarev, you're the CEO and founder of Wayray. Your technology is augmented reality dashboards. This is the idea that we'll be able to see information projected onto a windshield yeah. when driving in a car. Where are you in terms of development? You know, how close is that technology to being seen in cars? Yeah, I can, um, I, unfortunately, I cannot demonstrate it here. I don't have it in my pocket here. So, um, yeah, we think that we're global leaders in what we do in augmented reality in the hardware for for projecting the different types of content for the car, like navigation, like ADAS visualization, which is now necessary not only in self-driving cars, but in the future, we think that in the self-driving cars, it will be like the windshield will become a medium and side windows will become a medium for any types of information that uh, third-party developers could develop for passengers of robo cars, of robo taxis, and, uh, and just usual self-driving cars. So we are focused in this direction and we think that this is a completely new market that is appearing because of new technologies like this LiDAR technologies and all other uh, cell driving technologies. So for us and for third party developers, it's a completely new new marketplace. Okay, Ogi Radzik, you're the, the car maker here. So you're representing the part that actually gets these vehicles yep. on the road when it comes to it. Where, how, how is a car maker like the Renault Nissan Alliance looking at these new technologies and looking at implementing them? Well, we are, I don't know how many people know, but we are today the biggest uh, car group in the world. We ship more than 10 million cars. So if we are going to take these new technologies into the vehicle, we have to make sure they come at affordable prices and with a good quality that we can put in as many vehicles as possible. Clearly, our job is to make this kind of technology available to everybody, not just to people in high end, but really objective is very clear. We want to provide connected mobility for everybody, and that means being able to take interesting technologies from smaller companies, startups, and affordably put them in our cars and deploy in mass. So a critical thing for us is being able to get that scale, and that scale comes at all costs so that everybody can enjoy it. And I mean, cost is a big issue for, for you as well, because you're trying to bring down the cost of those LiDAR sensors absolutely. and make them more affordable. Right, right, uh, absolutely. And the only way we could do it was to use a uh, mature technology, we uh, make uh, our, uh, the, the chips that go inside the LiDAR uh, in 12 inch silicon CMOS wafers uh, to drop the cost as much as possible. Uh, ultimately, as, as really as any sensor in the car, just because the sensor is based on uh, laser 3D scanning does not mean that the automakers will pay more for it. A every automotive sensor, is a, a sensor has to have a roadmap to be below $100 per unit in volume. And we have a roadmap to eventually, actually, I have another thing here. Eventually <laughs> the- <laughs> You came prepared the, for show yes. yeah. Eventually the whole LiDAR will be actually a, a single chip. Uh, and at that point, the, the sale price will be below $100. Okay, and when you, in your conversations with car makers, how much are they talking to you about cost? Uh, about? About cost. About what cost? It's, uh, it starts with that. It's the reason they approach us. <laughs> <laughs> then we show them that we, have, we also happen to have the highest reliability and we have high performance. Uh, but really, uh, without cost, it doesn't matter how good the performance is. You could use an airplane surveying type LiDAR that costs $200,000. Who cares, right? Yeah. If I may just build on this, so it's clear there are some applications where we could afford to put a $50,000 LiDAR in a car. Robotax is a good example of that because we do expect these vehicles to generate revenue and over time pay for itself. 
But if you really want to be given autonomous driving technology to everybody, it has to be in hundreds. Otherwise, people will not be able to afford it. And right. Vitaly, you're, you're the next stage along in this process. You know, how will you be able to convince car makers and consumers, for that matter, that they're going to be willing to pay what inevitably will be extra for your technology? Actually, currently, OEMs are trying to convince us that their consumers need this. Uh, they think that, actually, the, it's the most natural way how to see uh, the navigation in the car, just to see it in augmented reality, in true augmented reality, not just to see it on the surface of the windshield, like current heads-up displays are, or in the IVI system. So people should believe, should trust to the autonomous car, and this is the most natural way how to do that, the augmented reality, the true augmented reality. So in our case, we don't convince OEMs, and also consumers are expecting more and more things happening in, in self-driving cars, and currently there is not much difference, I'm sorry to, uh, to say this, but not much big difference between OEMs, what they produce. Actually, people are expecting more technologies, more infotainment, more entertainment in the car, so this, now it's a battle of how people will feel themselves inside of current cars and self-driving cars in the future. So, and, and augmented reality is a big part of that. I mean, entertainment plus information about so, the trip. To give us an idea, when you look at your dashboard, what, yeah. what will you see? So, in, in self-driving car, so in self-driving car, you would see the navigation plus basic ADAS, like advanced driver assistance systems, visualization, plus on top of that, you could see any types of content that was, was developed previously by third-party developers. That could be uh, social networks, POI-based apps, uh, even games. So you can just sit in the cell driving car and you see everything like, and it's a new way of, of demonstrating the, uh, the content because it's not like in app style like on the iPad or, uh, or on your phone. It's like a running process because you're driving in the, in the city. So it's, I don't even, I cannot even imagine what kind of apps would be there, but I want to build a platform for, for, the, for, for the developers. But part of the, the current sense that we have of self-driving cars involves the element of there being some human control involved too. How do you balance the safety concerns of someone looking at Facebook on their windshield at the same time they should be paying attention to the road? Yeah, so there's a like so-called transition period between today and the fully level five full self-driving cars. So today we're just showing um, navigation and ADAS that, that helps people to navigate that, so they're not distracted to IVI system or to the dashboard. Next stage is then we're releasing the attention acts from giving more autonomous uh, features to the car, we can show more and more information, and that could be, so it's always a matter of, uh, so we count amount of attention acts, and we are able to demonstrate something else on top of the navigation and ADAS, when we know exactly that it's very, very safe. And in the conversations you're having with car makers, you know, are they bringing up regulation issues around this, about how that, you know, is gonna be it proved to be safe on the road? Yeah, of course, there's so-called uh, automotive greatness, which is a very abstract term. Uh, there is like a government re regulation, and on top of that, OEMs usually have their own uh, additional regulations. So they're usually more strict, but uh, in Tesla case, it's less strict. So some of OEMs are just trying to speed up and just give up on, on the regulations. Um, yeah, so uh, we... Uh, we, we are getting the requirements from them, and we always, because it's our brand name, our Wayray is a brand name of augmented reality for cars, so we want to be sure that it works everywhere, it works fine. Because like on top of the hardware, there has to be special software that has a predictive algorithms that are rendering this content around the car. So this is our trademark, and we are really, uh, we want to be really focused on the safety. Okay, and on the question of safety, of course, it comes up a lot when we talk about self-driving cars. Uh, you know, how, how are you working with car makers and regulators for your technology? Well, uh, we work typically through a tier one automotive supplier to uh, integrate the system in the vehicle. Uh, we provide uh, the hardware, and we pro which is basically the LiDAR, which is the eyes, and we provide some layers of the software, which is the AI or the brain. Uh, ultimately, the final solution, which is the full stack of software, will be integrated by the, the Tier 1 automotive supplier working with the OEMs, and they are the ones who have to commit to a certain functional uh, 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 safety level 
and uh, to performance and provide a warranty and, and, and uh, assurances. Uh, so um, we work through uh, tier ones. Okay. And I mean, that's really where you come in as well, because you have to get these cars on the road and make sure that they're approved for use. Yeah, so in the end of the day, uh, OEM is going to be responsible for some of the safety. There's no question about it. So we can never look to somebody else and say, well, it was your problem, it wasn't our problem. It's very clear to us that the systems that we get, autonomous driving has many components. On one side, you have sensing, what Louis covers. So we have very good, strong sensors. You have to fuse various sensors. It's not only going to be LIDAR, it's going to be cameras, right? radars, and other sensors that we use digital maps inside the car, somebody needs to fuse all of this, somebody needs to do uh, geolocation of, of, of or, and precision of the uh, location of the vehicle, and then you need to do some uh, uh, direction to the car. You need to actually say, okay, this situation, you should do this or that. And in that context, there's many, many steps, and we clearly have to be somebody that monitors safety of each individual component, but at the end of the day, we'll have to be uh, taking some responsibility on the overall control of the car as well. So clearly, safety is going to be one of the critical things. And when you look across, because you operate across the whole world, yeah. in different markets, do you see that progressing at a different rate? Well, there's some attempts to get this to be more unified, but I would say it's still going to very much depend on a local regulatory agency. So I expect in US, NHTSA is still going to be making the, the call. And are you in, under the impression there's strong demand from your consumers for cars to be changing extremely Absolutely. quickly to integrate these new things. Absolutely, there's definitely expectation even. I mean, we are launching more than 40 different models with autonomous driving over the next five years. So that tells you that we're not doing this because we didn't think there was a, there was a request from the market. Clearly, there's a big demand for level one, level two, level three autonomy. And ultimately, we see huge opportunity in urban mobility with robo taxis, uh, not just for people, but also for goods with robo delivery. And that's why level five is really, or level four, very functional level four is something we're aspiring for because it will give us opportunity to address the market that today is not addressed at all. And it was already mentioned, it gives capabilities of, of, of mobility for seniors, for people with disabilities, et cetera, at much lower cost. And because you, you know, the head of Renault Nissan, Carlos Ghosn, has set a very short deadline for these, you know, this technology yeah. to be on the road. Are you on track for this 20, 2020 for driving through cities? Is that yeah, still yeah. Uh, we already launched uh, more, a few vehicles. Uh, in Japan, we launched Serena, and New Leaf has uh, self-driving, oh, self autonomous driving capabilities. We have X-Trail, Rogue, all these cars have already been launched. With uh, level two, we're slowly progressing and impro improving level three is coming, and uh, you know, we're very much uh, on the timeline that we set for ourselves. And th there's an issue of security in terms of data around this as well. As cars get more involved, it's going to involve a lot more computing essentially being based in cars. I mean, this is really a question for all of you in terms of how do you keep the data that you're managing secure? I mean, we'll start with you, Vitaly. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, it's a good question. So there are so many startups like trying to to connect all these systems to make them more secure in the self-driving cars. So uh, uh, gladly, we're not touching security in direct, directly. So we are working always through tier one or through, through the OEM direct, uh, that, is, um, that has the control on the head unit and it takes care of the security. So we believe that if OEM is responsible, so what, I think that the, the OEM currently is just a, a brand name around which all the technologies are, are surrounded. So this is a trademark and this is a quality, quality mark. So OEM has to ensure its customers that uh, it is it is safe, so so we're we we're glad that OEM takes this mission <laughs> because yeah it's um, it's a very sensitive thing. I mean, well, <coughs> uh, the the issue of security uh, the, the, it, it means lots of things. There is uh, there is uh, cyber security. There is uh, physical security. Uh, with, with lidar, people wonder whether you could you know one could shine a, uh, a laser pointer at a lidar and confuse it. Uh, uh, obviously, we, we have worried about this uh, from the beginning. Uh, for instance, when we send uh, a, a laser pulse, it's not really just a laser pulse. It's a coded, uh, pseudo-random coded uh, pulse train. And it's only when that uh, same uh, pulse train that's coded comes back uh, to us that we know that we are looking at the right signal. So uh, someone shining a, a uh, laser pointer has absolutely no effect will not on, on, on uh, the lidar. We will not be. It will not be confused. Uh, in terms of uh, failure points, uh, there is always redundancy. Multiple lidars, lidars plus radar plus camera. Uh, there are many levels of redundancy. So a single point of failure is not even an option in automotive because 
it's a safety critical function. Your, our lives depend on it. And uh, you know, a single point failure is, is not an option. Yeah, I think we touched on two points, cybersecurity and safety. Yes. So cybersecurity, really, I can't disclose what we're doing because obviously there's a lot being done by each car maker. This is a very sensitive topic, big teams working on it. On safety, for, for the example that Louis just gave, it's very important to have redundancy. So we have uh, in the vehicles that are going to have uh, top levels of autonomous driving, we'll have uh, redundant steering, redundant braking, you'll have uh, redundant power. So there's a lot of systems in place that if one single system fails, uh, the other system can take over. And this is a critical part of any attempted self-driving vehicle. A, qu a question for all of you as we're coming towards the end. What's going to be the biggest change facing motorists five years from now? For people in this room who drive cars, what do you think is going to be the biggest difference for them five years from now? Vitaly. Well, it's, uh, com the industry will com be completely changed. Like, it's now obvious. I, I think that here we heard a lot of things about this, like I will not say these obvious things. Okay, like mobility as a service, robo, robo taxis, they will change the world, they will change, uh, the, even, even the price for, for, for robo taxi will, will get down so more people will be able to use taxis. Like a lot of people will lose their jobs and, and the industry is changing, like it will be vice versa, like OEMs will try to collaborate with, with IT companies, so a lot of things are happening. So we'll see it like in upcoming four or five, 10 years. Okay, Louis. In three to five years, um, uh, level four uh, autonomy will become common. Uh, today, uh, you see level two, level three uh, automation. Level four, which is basically uh, high level of autonomy, uh, almost full autonomy, but except you still have a driver behind the steering wheel, will be offered by most uh, OEMs. And that's gonna change our lives because uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna drive, the vehicles will drive safer than the humans. Uh, the, uh, we will be more productive. Uh, people who today don't have uh, a means of transportation will be able to, uh, to uh, get wherever they want. Uh, and whether it's uh, people who, are, who have, who have uh, some kind of impairment or the elderly or someone with poor eyesight or frankly even someone who might have had uh, a few drinks too many will be able to get home safely. Okay, okay, that's a, so you've got I'll two very pour, big visions pour there. Pour some cold water on this yeah. a little bit because uh, we absolutely believe this change is coming. I just don't think in the automotive cycle you can see that much change in five years. So what you're going to see is that this, these new features are being introduced. And again, as I said, we're actually introducing 40 different models with the capabilities. But to actually say by 2022 you will see a radical change in how we live our lives is probably not true. What you will see is in pockets where you will start seeing robotaxi tests and then you will see some commercial service probably by 2021, 2022 in a bigger scale, I would say, but this change, you know, these people in the room here are all techies, and they will want to participate in a change, but to really change that we're gonna change the society in the next five years, I don't think so, but we're gonna start the beginning of the change. Okay, on that semi-optimistic <laughs> note, Augie, Louis, and Vitaly, thank you for speaking to us thank at you. Web Summit. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.